You are listening to pastthink.com audiobook. Please like and subscribe. Thank you. Chapter 49. Kong Ming prays for an eastern wind at the altar of the seven stars. At the Red Cliffs, Zhou Yu uses fire to destroy Chao Chao's navy. You can imagine the dismay that Zhou Yu's collapse causes. With a million strong army descending upon them, what are the men of the South to do? Lu Su rushes off to inform Kong Ming of this disaster. What is your reading of this? asks Kong Ming, to which Lu Su replies that it is good for Chao Chao, but disastrous for the South. I can cure Zhou Yu, says Kong Ming, which of course is music to Lu Su's ears. So off they go to see Zhou Yu. Zhou Yu is laid out in bed, and when Kong Ming asks how he is feeling he says that his heart is in pain, and that he feels faint. Asked if he has taken medicine, he says he cannot get any down because of nausea. I have missed you in the last few days, says Kong Ming. Why have you fallen ill? Unexpected fortune or lack of fortune can come upon us at any time. Indeed, no one can be safe. Smiling, Kong Ming replies, and what of sudden winds from heaven? Indeed, no one can predict. At this Zhou Yu pales and groans, and Kong Ming adds, Are you feeling deeply troubled? Does it feel as if your heart is heavy with anxieties, to which Zhou Yu manages to gasp, Yes. Then you need something cool to rid you of this, says Kong Ming. Clearly your qi is out of balance, and once we balance it you'll be fine. Zhou Yu knows Kong Ming is talking in riddles, so he asks, What do you recommend? To which Kong Ming asks for pen and paper and writes something down. He then shows this to Zhou Yu, who reads, To defeat Chao Chao Fire is our best solution. But what can we do if the wind does not blow from the east? Zhou Yu is once again astonished and fearful of the unerring powers of Kong Ming and says, So you know what troubles me. What remedy can you offer, and quickly too? I've little in the way of skills, says Kong Ming, but I did learn from some magic books how to command the winds and call down rain. If we're going to need a southeasterly wind I'll need a special altar built, the altar of the seven stars, and this must be built on Nanping Mountain, nine feet high, with three levels, and surrounded by 120 men carrying banners. With this I should be able to create a wind that will blow for three days and nights. Will that do? And Zhou Yu agrees that this will more than do, but it must happen quickly. He then rises, his sickness cured, and orders that Kong Ming be supplied with whatever he needs. So Kong Ming travels with his workforce of 500 men, and the 120 banner carriers, and with Lu Su he starts work on creating the altar on Nanping Mountain. He selects a site with the best feng shui, and has red earth brought. Swiftly the altar arises, 240 feet in circumference, 9 feet high, with each level being 3 feet high. The symbols of the 28 constellations are placed on the lowest level, to the east, the symbol of a green dragon, to the north, the symbol of the black turtle, to the west, the symbol of the white tiger, and to the south, the symbol of the red bird. On the second level he has the symbols of the 64 hexagrams, while on the top level he places four men clothed in Daoist costume. One of them holds a pole with feathers at the top to detect the direction of the wind. One holds a pole with a belt with the symbols of the seven stars, again to detect the wind direction. The third man holds his sword and the fourth holds the incense burner. When all is ready, Kong Ming fasts, bathes and then mounts the altar barefoot, and with his hair falling upon his shoulders. Turning to Lu Su he says, I will do my best, but don't blame me if it doesn't work. Lighting the incense and sprinkling water, he stands and prays silently. Then he goes and rests. Three times he does this, and yet nothing happens. Back at the camp, Zhou Yu, Lu Su and others wait for the promised wind, and messengers are sent to Sun Quan to alert him to the plans and asking for reinforcements. The fire ships are ready, stuffed full of kindling soaked in fish oil and covered with sulfur, salt petri, and just about anything else that will burst into flames. News comes that Sun Quan is moored with his fleet awaiting developments, and yet no wind arises. It is at the time of the third watch in the night that the wind begins to blow. Within minutes a full-scale southeasterly is blowing. 
To this Zhou Yu reacts with yet another bout of his paranoia. Kong Ming is clearly in league with dark powers, with ghosts and evil spirits, if he is able to do this, he says. He is a threat to us all. He shouldn't be allowed to live. He summons two of his officers, Ding Feng and Su Sheng, and orders them to go immediately to Nanping Mountain, one by river the other by land, and to bring back the head of Kong Ming. Riding hard, Ding Feng and his cavalry arrive first, but can find no sign of Kong Ming. Discovering that he has left, Ding Feng rushes down the hill, where he finds Su Xing just landing from his boat. There they discover that Kong Ming has been seen setting sail in a boat that arrived commanded by Zhao Zilong. So off they go in pursuit by land and by water. Su Xing orders every sail to be unfurled, and soon he sees the little boat ahead of him, and, calling out, he tries to persuade Kong Ming to return to go and see our commander. Kong Ming just laughs and shouts back, tells Zhou Yu to be careful how he advances. I am going back to Xiaoko, but we'll meet again. Su Xing tries to persuade him again to stay, but Kong Ming shouts, I knew Zhou Yu would not want me to live, which is why Zhao Zilong came to collect me. So don't bother to chase after me. However, Su Xing is not that easily put off. Given his superior craft and the sails he has hoisted, he is sure he can easily overtake the little boat. But he has not reckoned on Zhao Zilong. As Su Xing's boat draws closer and closer, Zhao Zilong stands up and notches an arrow to his bow. I am Zhao Zilong, he shouts, and I've come on express orders to bring our advisor home. Why are you chasing him? Myself, I would like to kill you, but that might do damage to the relationship between our two leaders. But I'll show you what I can do. And so saying, he lets fly the arrow. Swiftly it cuts through the air, and then slices through the rope holding up the main sail. Down it comes, crashing into the water, and the hapless vessel begins to swing round and round as Zhao Zilong and Kong Ming disappear in their little boat, far beyond sight. Returning to Zhou Yu, Su Xing reports their failure, and it takes Lu Su's common sense to calm things down by pointing out that they should wait until after defeating Chao Chao to deal with Kong Ming. Now it is time to launch the attack. Zhou Yu sends Gan Ning with Kai Zheng to destroy the grain supply of Chao Chao, telling them to go flying the banners of the north to fool the enemy. Taishu Ci is sent to Huangzhou to be ready to cut off Chao Chao's men in Hafei. Watch for a red banner, said Zhou Yu. That will be the sign that our Lord Sun Quan's troops have arrived. Lu Meng is sent to assist Gan Ning and to burn the main camp of Chao Chao. Another detachment is sent to Yiling ready for action while yet another detachment is sent to take Hanyang. From there they are to attack the enemy along the river. Once they are on their way, Huang Gai readies his fireboats, and then sends a letter to Chao Chao announcing that he will desert that very night. For fleets, each of 300 ships, are ready, with fireboats in the van. News comes from Sun Quan that he has dispatched troops towards Qizhou and Huangzhou. Hearing that, Zhou Yu sends men to the western hills with fire bombs, and to raise the battle banner on Nanping Mountain. Now all that remains is to wait for dusk to fall, and for the battle to commence. So while we wait, let's return to Shwanda. Anxiously he has waited for Kong Ming's return, so he is delighted, when the little boat comes into sight. Soon Kong Ming, Shwanda, Lu Qi, Zhao Zilong, and the two brothers are in conference. The time for action has come. Kong Ming sends Zilong to cross the river at Wulin and prepare an ambush, because he knows that Chao Chao will retreat that way. Wait until half his force has gone past then set fire to the undergrowth. We may not catch Chao Chao, but at least half his detachment will die. Next, he sends Zhang Fei to cross the river and block the roads to Yiling. Here he can catch Chao Chao if he heads to North Yiling. He'll stop to cook food, and as soon as you see the smoke, set fire to the hill. You probably won't catch Chao Chao, but this'll be of great assistance anyway. Next, he sends Mi Zhu, Mi Fong and Lu Feng to attack the enemy on the river, and to seize all the weapons they can. Lu Qi is sent to Wu Chang because Chao Chao's men will probably try to escape that way. But do not under any circumstances leave the city, warns Kong Ming. Finally, he says to Shuanda, 
go to Fenko and from there watch how Zhou Yu leads his men into battle. Standing to one side throughout this has been Guan Yu, to whom no task has been assigned. Unable to stand this any longer, he erupts, I've never been left out before while my brothers go into battle. What's going on? Chow Chow once treated you most kindly, and this means you're sure to feel that you must repay him. My concern is that this will mean you will let him pass if you are sent to block his path along a road. That is why I haven't assigned you a role. What? exclaims Guan Yu. That is why you don't trust me? I've repaid Chow Chow many times, killing Yuan Chao's commander Yen Liang, executing Wen Chou, breaking through the siege at Bema. Do you really think I would let him go now? Yes, but what if you did, says Kong Ming, pushing Guan Yu hard. Then let military law for treason be my judge. All right, but put that down in writing, says Kong Ming, unwilling to let him off the hook. So Guan Yu is given command of the ambush on the road to Huarong. He is to lure Chao Chao that way by setting fire to the brushwood. This will make Chao Chao think an ambush has already been sprung and encourage him to try to force his way through. It is only when Guayu has left that Shuanda confesses he fears Guan Yu's sense of honor will mean he will let Chao Chao escape. To this Kong Ming replies that he has studied the stars, and Chao Chao is not due to die tomorrow. So he has put Guan Yu there to perform an act of kindness, which will greatly enhance Guan Yu and make no difference to the fate of Chao Chao. Back now to Chao Chao, who is waiting for confirmation that Huang Gai has abandoned Zhou Yu and is on his way. Even though the wind has shifted to the southeast, Chao Chao is blasé about it. The letter from Huang Gai arrives, and Chao Chao reads that not only is he planning to come over to Chao Chao, but he will also capture the grain ships which are coming to supply Zhou Yu and the southern army. These he will bring as a tribute to Chao Chao. Back again to the south side, and Zhou Yu has ordered Kai He to be brought to his tent. Bound and terrified, he is thrown at the feet of Zhou, where he pleads that he has committed no crime. Really, says Zhou Yu. You think you can come over here pretending to join us, and we won't guess this is a trick? Well we did, and today you'll be the sacrifice needed to consecrate our banners. At this, Kai He is marched down to the riverbank, and they're executed, his blood poured as a libation to the banner. Then and only then do the ships set sail. Leading the attack and heading for the area known as the Red Cliffs is Huang Gai in full battle armor, and with a huge banner on his vessel proudly declaring that he is vanguard Huang Gai. Chao Chao, already gloating over his impending victory, looks out over the waters and sees coming towards him, just as promised, a boat with the standard of Huang Gai. Truly this is a sign of the will of heaven, says Chao Chao, but his smug reflections are suddenly punctured by Ching Yu's desperate cry. It's a trick. They mustn't come near us. What are you talking about? demands Chao Chao. If he was bringing grain in these vessels, they would be much, much lower in the water. Instead these boats are so light they are flying down the river, aided by the wind. There's no stopping them. In an instant Chao Chao sees he has been fooled, and in desperation asks for someone to try to stop the attack. When Ping volunteers, and with a flotilla of a dozen, or so small ships tries to head off the armada. But no sooner does he get near than an arrow takes him out, and the flotilla flees in disarray. Now, with the raising of his sword, Huang Gai gives the signal to fire the boats. Sped on by the wind, the flames race across the boats as they bear down on Chao Chao's navy. Twenty fireboats crash into the chained ships, and, as there is no escape, the flames tear across from ship to ship to ship in an instant. From the south shore, catapults hurl huge missiles to add to the confusion, death and destruction. Every surface of the junction of the three rivers seems to be on fire, so intense is the conflagration. Chao Chao looks about him, seeking how to escape. Huang Dai spots him, jumps into a skiff and sets off after him. Zhang Liao drives through to rescue him in a small boat, and Chao Chao leaps in, and now it is a race to see who lands first. Stop, you traitor, roars Huang Gai, waving his sword. Huang Gai has indeed come. But these are his last words of defiance to Chao Chao. Zhang Liao fires an arrow, which takes Huang Gai full in the armpit, 
and, felled by this blow, he falls into the river. With the fires of fate roaring, he too met his fate by water. While beating with wood had healed. It is an iron arrow that toppled him. Can he survive to enjoy the victory he has helped make? Let's find out.